This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, can I welcome members uh, to this morning's meeting and I start the meeting in, in open session. Um, can I advise members of the need to maintain social distancing during the meeting and also a, a brief overview of the day's business is as follows. The committee will consider subordinate legislation, a departmental briefing on the budget and a briefing by the road haulage and logistics sector. Can I also advise members that due to the, to the witnesses and some members joining the meeting remotely, it would be helpful if members use the hand up icon to register uh, that they wish to ask questions at each agenda item. Also, if members and witnesses could mute their mics uh, when they are not speaking, it would allow everyone to hear the evidence and follow the meeting. Uh, can I also advise members that the room must be vacated by 12.10 at the latest and uh, request that members keep that in mind when asking questions. Apologies, uh, we don't have any at present. Uh, I know some members will be joining us at a later stage in the meeting. Uh, agenda item number two, which is uh, chairperson's business. Uh, there is none. Um, agenda item number three, which is draft minutes. And can I turn members' <coughs> attention to page six, draft minutes of the meeting on the 29th of September 2021. Are members content that the minutes are a true and accurate reflection? Agreed? Great. Great. Okay. Thanks, members. Yeah. Thank you, members. Agenda item number four, um, which is matters arising. And I turn members' attention to page 14, uh, matters arising from the meeting on the 29th of September 2021. Members, bear with me. Okay. Um, can I ask uh, members if they have any uh, issues arising from the meeting? Any? Don't see anybody signalled. You can see there from page fourteen uh, the um, matters arising correspondence and uh, committee. Everyone's happy enough. Okay. Thank you, members. Uh, can I also turn your attention to page seventeen, uh, which is the outstanding um, request for information. Uh, members will see uh, that in relation to particularly around the, the planning notice. Uh, from we're, we're receiving quite a number of correspondence from local councils and we have a, no, a number of others still to submit. Uh, are members content uh, with the information before us? Content? Okay. Agenda item number five. Can I draw members' attention to uh, correspondence memo at page 31 of your meeting packs? Uh, at page 43 and, uh, and 112, you'll see the response from the, the Minister of Infrastructure to the committee meeting on the 8th of September and from her briefing on the 15th of September. Uh, can I also remember, remind members, and you will see them mentioned there in the <coughs> Minister's uh, letter to the committee, uh, that issues on the biannual MOTs and rural planning, the committee is due to receive briefings from the Department in the coming weeks on these particular issues. Uh, is any member anything? Oh, I see a couple of hands up now, so I will go to members. So I'll go firstly to uh, Cahill Boylan, please. Thank you, Chair. Just two issues to raise. One, obviously, is in relation to page 43. Um, Chair, clearly we transferred powers to plan um, a number of years ago, and I think that, unfortunately, it was plan uh, advice note issued over the summertime to local authorities and... I think the minister not giving it a fair hearing. I think that um, this plan will have an impact on rural communities. It will restrict opportunities for rural communities. And if we look towards the SPPS, the SP SPPS is about sustainable rural communities. And I think there needs to be more done in relation to that. Okay. And I, th I think the, the authority lies with local authority. And I think we need, we need to... Um, I would like the committee support direct to the local councils to see exactly how it's going to impact on local authority and see what impacts they have. But because I'm getting it from councillors and from agents and others, and I, I think it would be best for us as a committee just yes. to try and find out or ascertain exactly the impact it's going to have. Okay. Because I think the policy originally was very restrictive, but I think these guidelines that are issued are going to restrict for the restrict opportunities for people to live in the countryside. And I think right in the councils right across the board and appreciate that what one I think Mid Ulster Council has written to the committee is part of it's in our correspondence there. So 
Cal, um, I'd like to really, yeah. moment on that. So there's a couple of issues you've raised. Um, number one is that we as a committee have already requested councils to write to the committee with their views on the, the planning advice note. What you're seeing coming back now is the responses. We still have a number to come back. So that point has already been Sorry, actioned. Charlie, I missed, I missed yeah. last week's yeah. meeting and just get that. Sorry. So that, that point has already been actioned through the committee and we're starting to receive responses. But in relation to your broader point, I have sympathy with the points that you've raised. In fact, unless I'm mistaken, I think all parties that spoke on this issue when it last came before the committee, <coughs> uh, before the minister actually came before the committee, had similar concerns in relation to its impact on uh, uh, the rural community uh, and uh, the, the policy in itself uh, and how it's been interpreted. Now, I will note that the Minister for Infrastructure has said now on some four or more occasions uh, at, in the floor of the House that this does not change uh, the policy. But the problem is it's being interpreted as a change in policy. So I think if the committee is in agreement, we do have the Chief Planner with us next week in which this issue will be teased out. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, Cahill, that I think that the committee uh, can push on this more to try and get some further clarity and try to see that if an unintentional harm has been caused by this planning advice note, and I think that uh, the committee can come at that from a united perspective, unless anybody has a different opinion on it, but I'll take other questions now on it. Uh, so if um, members are content, and I'll, I'll let other members speak, but uh, if members are content, I'm happy for us to um, to task our, our officials here, or their clerks, to, to um, look into what impact. We've already gathered the impact on local councils. I've also asked to write um, to um, the Farmers Union on this as well. I think that's already been tasked. And also, if there's any other information that we can be provided with before we meet with the planner, chief planner next week, and following that meeting, after we scrutinised the chief planner in relation to this issue, we can then agree to, uh, have an agreed approach on how we uh, further escalate this. So I'll take Andrew and Dolores, and then uh, Patrick in the room. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just in relation to the pan, um, there obviously is SPSS um, already there, and that the pan doesn't change that. Uh, but I do accept there are concerns in terms of the if there's an interpretation from the PAN that the policy has changed. But I think it's important that we give an opportunity next week to engage with departmental officials in relation to this. Uh, also aware that there's a motion coming to the Assembly in regards to this, and also that we have written to the district councils asking for their views in relation to this. Um, also, in addition to all of that, I think it's important to understand the policy context of where SPSS came, and it is about protecting our natural environment. So it's important to take that into context. Uh, my issue is separate in relation to MOT, so I don't know whether you want to take that now. Uh, or do you want to move to the PAN? What I could do, Andrew, does anybody else wish to speak on the PAN? I've got one in the room. Dolores, is yours on the PAN or another issue? Yes, yes, Okay, sir. so Andrew, I'll come back to you on that. Uh, if I go yeah, to Dolores on the PAN and then in the, in the room with Patrick. <laughs> Um, Chair, as someone who, uh, a bit like Cahill says, stood in many a country gap trying to argue the case for planning permission, um, it, uh, it's my understanding that the issue of this plan advice was to try to ensure some level of consistency and in interpretation, but that suggests that some areas, if you like, were more lax or uh, in terms of their interpretation. So it'd be interesting to know, you know, ac across the different councils, you know, were there problems in particular areas around interpretation? Uh, because um, I was always very concerned at PPS 14 and PPS 21 and what it would mean to uh, rural communities, uh, notwithstanding you know, the, the protection of sustainable development and, and all the rest of it. But it just takes so long now for area plans to be reviewed or, uh, that actually uh, our villages, in terms of the very tight boundaries, you know, are, are caught, and and, and certainly in, in uh, chair our constituency, if you if you remember, uh, there was the uh, different areas that you had to use up all the planning approvals in one area. Uh, uh, I think it was area A and area B. I can't remember the, yes. uh, zone the, 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 the proper title, yeah. but. Uh, 
you know, it actually was very constraining on areas, particularly where you had um, some villages uh, where, you know, some of our schools are at risk in some of our villages, but yet, you know, it takes so long for the area plan actually to be reviewed that I think sometimes the rural areas are forgotten about a wee bit. So I, I for one, would like to know what prompted the plan and advice in terms of the advice from officials, uh, if there were particular council areas into, uh, as being plan authorities uh, in terms of their interpretation. Yeah, if that makes sense, sure. Yeah, I think think that's a fair point, and I think that's uh, something that we can tease out with the chief planner next week. I think what you do, you raise two issues there. One is about uh, the inability to, if it's, and I think particularly you're talking about the Craig Avon area where the zone A, zone B, and zone C, and, and they couldn't develop out at zone Z until A or B was finalised. And in some instances, what you had was uh, people that didn't want to develop their land and therefore it was driving people from a rural community to go and seek housing elsewhere. That, that is an issue and that's something that we can raise with the Chief Planner, but we must bear in mind that that is not actually in relation to this particular planning advice note, which is largely uh, designed around the, the, the advice note on infill dwellings in the countryside. So we can take that up and we will uh, with the Chief Planner <coughs> next week. I'll go to Patrick on the same issue, please. Yeah, no, it's on page 45 I wanted to come to. Is it on the same issue? I'll come back to you because I did have Andrew first. Andrew, do you want to go on your point? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and it's appreciated. It's just in relation to, um, so it's page 46, MOT backlog. Um, we're, we're, like, we're probably all aware on this committee of the issues arising as a result of the MOT backlog, and there's two very acute issues. One is the because of people's inability to get an MOT appointment, and get an MOT, there's two issues arising. One is that some insurers are not saying that their insurance is valid because they can't get an, an MOT appointment or an MOT. Uh, and also in relation to the ability to renew motor tax, that's also arising as an issue. These are becoming acute issues, Chair, because people need their motor vehicles for their employment often and for, for key things within their life. So I would like to propose we write back to the Minister to ask for consideration is given to the issuing of temporary exemption certificates to try to deal with some of the more acute issues in relation to this, because this is becoming a real issue and not a day passes that someone contacts my office in relation to this. Thank you, Andrew. It's an issue, I think, for us all. Perhaps, if you would, would agree, maybe the committee could ask to have a briefing from the national insurers to, to see what the because I know I think the minister did say that she had met with uh, insurers on this particular issue, but perhaps maybe it would be useful for the committee to get a briefing from them as well to see the impact that it's having because that is a concern that I would have as well as chair. So, yeah, I agree with that. Royal probably Royal probably come in on this, but you know, in terms of the evidence that was given last week, you know, I'm not seeing the great evidence base in relation to why the temporary exemption certificates can't be issued. OK, no, point well taken. Yeah. Uh, if it's, is it on the same point? On this issue. OK, I'll let Roy come in at this point and then I'll go to Patrick and start. Uh, again, just to support, supporting what Andrew said, I, I've been chasing this issue in particular uh, as well. Um, if you cannot get your car taxed, uh, you have to take it off the road. Um, uh, if you continue, if you, if you do not notify and give a SORN uh, notice to uh, DVLA in England and Swansea, uh, in due time, you get an £80 fine. Uh, so, and, and then potentially even, I think fines are up to £2,500. So there is a major issue about people being unable to tax their cars. There's also a, a, a possible solution, and that solution is around the exemptions. Zero exemptions have been issued during uh, August and September in a recent Assembly question that, that I asked. And then last week when I uh, asked the road safety official who was in front of the committee about whether this was having any impact on, on accidents. He said that there was no noticeable change in uh, accidents being caused by uh, the, the, the exemptions that, that were issued over the past period. Now, in particular, newer vehicles uh, are very uh, are, are less likely to have mechanical problems. So I, I, I think we should be pushing for uh, perhaps younger vehicles to be given extensions, perhaps five years. I understand you have to have yeah. uh, a test after the three-year uh, initial exemption for a new new vehicle. There has to be a test after that. But subsequent to that test, yes. should we not be issuing exemptions? It's already been consulted uh, about widening uh, And if we can take some of that yep. uh, backlog out of the system, 
the, the MOT staff who are working at capacity seem to be uh, uh, inspecting okay. almost as much as normal and should, should be able to maintain the situation. But we need to take the backlog to create a, a window for those applying. And it seems to be a simple solution to grant exemptions, particular to newer vehicles which are less likely to have problems. Yep. So I think we should have written to the Minister on that issue. Uh, and thank you, Roy. And I know that this is something that, that we have all been concerned about um, over this course of the summer and, and now into the autumn, uh, with considerable numbers still in the backlog. And with, I think the committee, it's been difficult to ascertain the numbers now in the, in the backlog only from what we're getting, you know, anecdotally from, from constituents. But it, it, there, it is a case of that the, the backlog is such that they, they can't meet. They may be eating into the backlog, but again, uh, they're not eating into the, the natural queue. So what I would suggest, if members were content, that uh, if that is a, a position that members would like to adopt, that we proactively uh, write now to the department on the back of Roy's suggestion and, and uh, proposal uh, to request that uh, an action point such as exemption notices for newer vehicles after that test is something an avenue in which they explore. Would members be content uh, for for us to, to issue that from uh, as a committee? Okay, okay, members are content. Uh, thank you. Go to Patrick. Yeah, it's on page 45. It states that the department is looking to provide a grant scheme for reservoir managers and to assist with the cost of capital works. Um, I'm looking to see if there's an indicative timetable as to when these grants can start. Uh, obviously, reservoir safety is an imperative issue for the department, so I think that it's important that we have some clarity around when that's actually going to start. Okay, uh, we'll happily take that forward as an action point. We can write to the, to the department on that. Um, I have another hand. I see Liz Kimmins. Thanks, Chair. Chair, my name's just about the CPZ. It's on page one one five. Um, again, you know, the responses we we'd asked for. Well, I certainly had raised that I want to see the evidence where CPZs. Um, you know, encourage driver motorists not to come into town centres and all of that, which has been repeatedly um, mentioned by the department, by the minister. But I mean, it, certainly the response here doesn't doesn't state that. And I think, you know, it's it's I don't know whether they're being facetious in saying that this is, you know, it's not sort of the city centres are not for the convenience of motorists. I don't think anyone has, has ever suggested that. You know, certainly the presentation from Newry Bid and Lisburn and Castlereagh uh, Chamber has never suggested that it's all about um, focusing on the convenience of motorists. So I think that's a very poor response, in my opinion, Chair. Um, so, I mean, I certainly, again, I just want to re-emphasise the point that I would like to see the evidence that CPZs, um, you know, reduce motorists coming into the city centre. What we're trying to do is support local business and keep things flowing in a fair and equitable way. Um, and I don't think that's too much to ask. So again, I think it's just a very fair response in relation to that, Chair. Okay, thank you. And this is a point that you've continually raised. You know that the committee did give opportunity to have that briefing. So uh, I would suggest that perhaps Member has her point on record here at the committee, but perhaps also can use other means via uh, written questions and indeed uh, Member's motions to, to, to raise the issue. Okay, uh, if any other Members want in correspondence? Cahill? Yes, Chair, uh, and I would support the actions in relation to the plan and the um, Chair. Chair, there's one other issue on this page 109 in terms of the bus and coach scheme. Um, I know that the, the industry was on last week on the, one of the BBC Inside Business programmes outlining the, the problems they're facing at the minute and they've repeatedly been asking for supports. And I know that the Minister had written to the Economy Minister in relation to the escorted coach and private tour support scheme. But I mean, Chair, sure, that, will, that will still leave people out. I mean, there's people in the industry going to be still excluded and there's, there's a significant number of the fleet idle at the minute. I think it's something like 75%. So yeah. um, I would like to support the uh, committee direct to the minister to seek more support or all the supports for the industry at this time. Okay, yeah, and I think I've, I've read that letter uh, from the Chief Executive of Bus and Coach NI, and I suppose that there's two very different issues there in relation to the provision uh, and support packages and where they will come from. Um, so I, I would be happy to support that, Cahill, and I think the committee can write to the department to urge for more support uh, from the department on that particular. So are members agree with that you. action point as well? Okay, I've taken a final one here on correspondence from... Uh, I'm, I'm moving on. Just the last one, it's page 115 and it states that the department is taking um, larger scale one-off resourcing contracts and those aren't areas without 
a current resurfacing contract or resource. So from that I want to know what information we have on this, can we get any more? Uh, what's the scope and what's the time frame for delivering this contract? Is this in relation to Roads Maintenance and Rural Recovery Fund? Yeah, 115. Okay. okay. Well, we can we can certainly ask for that that information. Okay, members, moving on down. So obviously, a lot of these issues will come up next week with the chief planner when he comes before the committee. We've raised the position at 109 in relation to bus, bus and coach uh, NI. Um, also, bring members' attention to page 227, response from TransLink regarding cross-border bus services. I know this is something that Ms. Kimmins had raised. Uh, you may wish to respond to that, or you're happy to note the correspondence received. Happy to note. Okay. So members are content with the actions as suggested in the correspondence memo, plus the points that members have raised and agreed to at the committee. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much, members. Moving on to agenda item number six, which is subordinate legislation. SL1 is not subject to assembly procedure. Can I advise members that there is one proposal for a statutory rule not subject to assembly proceedings at page 230? Uh, SL1, the Prohibition of Waiting Schools Amendment No. 3, Northern Ireland Order 2021. Are members content uh, with the proposals for the statutory rule? Content. Thank you, members. Content. Agenda item number seven, subordinate legislation, SR is not subject to assembly procedure. Can I advise members that there are two statutory rules not subject to assembly proceedings? There have been no changes to policy content since the SL1s were considered by the committee. At page 235, SR 2021-273, the Parking Places, Disabled Persons Vehicles, Amendment No. 7 Order, Northern Ireland 2021. At page 239, SR 2021-275, the Prohibition of U-Turns, Belfast Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Can I advise members to note the statutory rules unless they have any issues to raise on the proposals? Are members content with the statutory rules? Content. Agreed. Okay, uh, agenda item uh, number eight, SR uh, 2021 270, the Planning uh, Development Management Temporary Modifications Coronavirus Amendment Number Two Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. I turn members' attention to page 245, the statutory rule. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 22nd of September 2021 uh, and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. The department has advised that uh, it has not uh, complied with the 21-day rule in setting an operational date of the 1st of October 2021. It apologises for this breach. However, in this case, due to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, the department considers it necessary to implement the proposed legislation as soon as possible in order to assess the development industry at this time. Are members content with this rule? Content. content. Okay. Uh, can I read in then the following motion that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2021-270, uh, SR 2021-270, the Planning Development Management Temporary Modifications, Coronavirus Amendment No. 2 Regulation, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Great. Okay, members, uh, I've just been notified we are now meant to have a, a budget briefing and agenda, uh, agenda item number nine, but we may need to pause uh, f for this briefing as there is some technical problems now with officials on the line. So um, I, I'm going to revise here five minutes, so we could adjourn, suspend the meeting for five minutes, and then we will come back with that budget briefing. Thanks, members. <coughs> This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, uh, thank you. The, the meeting is now back in public session. Uh, I think our officials have joined us uh, now, so at this stage, uh, can I welcome, attending via Starleaf, uh, Mr. Declan McGowan, Deputy Secretary, Resources, Governance and EU Group, uh, Ms. Susan Anderson, Director of Finance, and Mr. Connor Lockery, Director of Network Services, Roads. And could I remind officials, please, uh, there is, seems to be a bit of background noise and feed on the line. If, if those that aren't uh, participating can mute uh, while it's, uh, whoever it is that is giving the presentation. So can I hand over to officials please to give their briefing. Okay, apologies, I'm not getting any response uh, from Officials, could somebody raise their hand if they're hearing me? Oh, that's a raised hand. <laughs> I can indeed. Is that Connor? No, it's Declan. Not. Declan. Okay, yes, Declan, I can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to begin your presentation? I uh, will. Thank you. And apologies for the connection issues um, some from the technology side here, but we'll begin. Okay. So thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to attend the committee today. I welcome the chance to provide an update to members on the October monitoring round and to provide an update on our department's in-year budget position. I'm joined this morning by Susan Anderson, our finance director, and Connor Lockery, our director of network services. Firstly, Chair, I want to sincerely apologise for the lateness of the written briefing being provided to the committee members. As members will appreciate, monitoring rounds require careful and close scrutiny of the financial position, and there are a number of financial uncertainties which we have been considering over recent days to ensure that the most accurate and reliable position is reported and that bids put forward are robust. I propose today to focus on the 21-22 budget and I will in due course provide separate briefing to the committee on the 22-25 budget at the appropriate time. Before I turn to the October monitoring position, I would like to advise the committee on the outcome of the June monitoring round. As you will see in the written briefing provided, the outcome was disappointing for the department with only three million of our non-COVID resource pressures being met. This has therefore meant that the starting position for October monitoring has been challenging, a significant service being unfunded, creating real difficulties to deliver and maintain a reasonable level of public service. Turning now to October monitoring, the committee has been provided with written briefing that outlines resource non-COVID bids, which total 49.6 million. These bids reflect the baseline pressures remaining at this stage of the year and the inescapable external influences, such as energy costs that the department, like many others, are subject to. In particular, Increase in energy costs are a significant pressure for Northern Ireland water, as it is the largest consumer of electricity in Northern Ireland. While funding was secured for NI Water in the opening budget and at June monitoring to meet the utility regulars' price determination, a further 19.7 million is now required to meet the unforeseen substantial increase in electricity prices. In addition, the pressure facing our public transport service is 24 million, which reflects the shortfall in funding for TransLink. This level of to ensure that the cost of running our public transport network can be met. Further resource bids have also been submitted, including four million for water for winter service, which is required to deliver what would be considered an average winter, 
along with 1.9 million for roads pressures, including energy costs for street lighting. COVID continues to impact on the income generated by the department and our arm's length bodies, and bids totaling 26.4 million have been made to address this. In addition to lost income for public transport port and DBA, a bid has been included for support to the taxi industry. Our minister is keen to provide support to the taxi industry and therefore a bid has been submitted to support the minister's plans to provide financial support to first-time taxi drivers aimed at addressing the shortage in taxi drivers and to cover the cost of taxi meter tests following the consultation on revised taxi fares. Finally, on capital, the department is carefully managing and scrutinising its capital budget. There remains significant uncertainty over deliverability of the structural maintenance budget as a result of the legal challenges and potential cost increases emerging in the delivery of the complex A6 Dungiven, the Drumahoe flagship scheme. The department is continuing to seek to maximise spend on structural maintenance. Therefore, given the high level of uncertainty at this stage, no bids or reduced requirements are being declared at October monitoring, though of course this will be closely monitored throughout the remainder of the year. In closing, it is important to reiterate that the Minister is very keen to get the Committee's views and support in shaping and delivering improvements to people's everyday lives, and she welcomes your constructive challenge and input. I hope that this discussion around October monitoring will assist the Committee in understanding the challenges that Minister faces and the difficult financial decisions that will have to be taken in the coming months, depending on how the resource position in particular develops. Thank you. We're happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you, Declan. And can I just also reiterate, I don't think it, it was befitting uh, of the committee to receive this briefing at, at half eight uh, on a night before that the committee is due to meet and discuss uh, the budget briefing. I think it does a disservice not only to DFI, but also uh, to this committee and its scrutiny of, of such important uh, of such an important uh, session, uh, given this uncertainty and pressures facing the department at present. So I want to put that on record, and I hope that uh, it's not a recurring uh, theme in our time that we have left of this mandate. Okay, so can I just ask, uh, so you asked for £36.7 million for non-COVID pressures and got £3 million. Uh, What was the impact of this? Uh, what was there that you should have done that you didn't have the money to do? And that's going back to the period in October. So really then the, the impact of that is that we've had to continue now to put those bids forward um, as part of October monitoring. The largest element of that is really in relation to the translate pressure, um, which you'll see then is carried forward into the current monitoring round as well. So in terms of that... I'm not, I can't pick it up, it's very bad reception. Okay, yes. Uh, Susan, unfortunately, I think maybe it's your wee bit of a distance from the microphone. It's, it's hard to pick up here at committee. <laughs> I can, yes, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, okay. Sorry, apologies, I'll start again. So the majority of the pressure um, remaining at June monitoring relates to the translink um, pressure. And as the committee members will see, we have bid for that again um, as part of this October monitoring round. And really that translink pressure is the difference between the costs that translink expect to incur this year versus the income that they expect um, to receive in. So in terms of operational delivery, it hasn't impacted um, because obviously Translink are continuing to deliver the service um, as planned. Okay. Um, anybody else, anything else you wish to add to that comment? It's a broad overview. No? Was happy enough? Okay, so how much do you expect to get from, from this monitoring round and have you good cause for optimism given what you've bid in the past and, and a small allocation? Sure, it, it, it'd be difficult to say really. I mean, there are competing priorities right across government at the moment, so it, it's difficult for us to say at this stage what exactly we, we think we'll get, but, but we, we would hope that we would get enough to, to continue running vital public services. Okay, and in relation to the roads winter services, so uh, it's been on, on the record in this committee and indeed in the floor of the House regarding the state of many of our rural roads in particular. Uh, the Rural uh, Roads Fund will, will go some way to try and help alleviate those pressures. But uh, I am suppose I'm a wee bit concerned. So obviously it talks of a four million uh, bid, uh, for which will hopefully be enough and required uh, to, to service a, an average winter. But given the state that our roads are in, 
uh, given the potential that we could have a harsher winter. That's always that's always an option. Nobody's in control of the weather. How sure are are, are officials uh, that this bid is adequate? Well, Chair, typically, I'll, I'll pass to Connor in a moment, but typically in, in recent years, the, the total cost around winter service is in around £7 million. So, so, so we have that time series, for want of a better expression, to, to, to demonstrate that that's in and around what the cost would be. And of course, as you say, so, some roads need more repair than others, but, but we would be fairly optimistic that £7 million should be enough to provide that service. Connor, I don't know if there's anything additional you want to add to that? Um, yes. Definitely, yes, Chair. Yeah, the, the four million really tops up to three million that we've received to date, which gives us seven million, which is our average cost of a, a gritting service um, over the winter. We can obviously we'll see how the winter goes, pans out between now and January, and we'll pick stock again in January for January monitoring now to see when, as we're a better place to uh, have a feel for what, what the likely outturn might be. And, Okay. We'll know then what sort of a winter we've had, or at least you know, have a better picture. Okay, and I will say, Connor, your line's particularly difficult. Maybe that's with Wi-Fi. Um, but I suppose, um, I suppose, to get my head around this in relation to the roads, uh, winter services, is this um, four million, and indeed the other three, the top up as you talk about, is this entirely for in-house? Uh, a budget, or is this potentially for? Is there contractors involved in some of this scheme, in particular, or gridding and, and other issues to to help alleviate winter pressures? Connor, yeah, you want to come in there? Know that, uh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 no, that that seven million pounds is just purely for the gridding. That's the the internal cost for for, for gridding. It doesn't deal with any consequences of a bad winter around potholes and that. It's purely the gradient service. Okay, and I suppose that that's, answers that question. And given, rolling on from that, given the uncertainty over the delivery of structural contracts due to legal challenges, if this budget is not spent, can you use it for some of the other priorities? Okay. Yeah. yeah so, sorry, I'll, I'll pick up and responding to that one. So again, in terms of capital, so structural maintenance is part of the capital budget. So we were managing that capital budget at an overall global level. And as the committee members will be aware, then we did have an over-planning amount, um, just around 22 million at the start of the year, which is good, prudent financial management. So again, we're trying to work that balance down as well. Um, and any potential then easements that come through, and any, any of the capital schemes, actually not just structural maintenance, we will use to offset initially the over-planning amount. Any other pressures that may arise on other schemes or anything else in capital, and then as well, we'll look for further contingency projects um, as we did at the start of the year. Um, and also, we are closely monitoring some further um, potential emerging cost pressures as well. And we'll keep a, a close eye on that between now and then the final monitoring round of this financial year. Okay, thank you. Could I go to Liz Kimmins for a question? Thanks, Chairman, and thank you to, to all the officials for coming this morning. I mean, I suppose the road resurfacing contracts are, are one of the big ones, and it just was to try and get a sense of how much of the funding has been affected by the current um, legal challenge. I suppose one of my concerns would be that those uh, resurfacing, the planned programme of resurfacing that's obviously delayed, you know, it certainly affects my constituency here in Erie, Morn and Down. Um, what would happen if they're not completed before the end of this financial year? You know, what would happen to that funding that had been set aside? Um, so to get a wee bit of an idea of, of, of the impact of that. Yeah, yeah um, so originally the Minister had bid for £120 million for, the, for this year, but on, on account of the legal challenges, we recalibrated that, and we're looking more towards £80 million. But we are developing mitigation plans, and, and we would be hopeful, optimistic at this stage, that we could come in somewhere in a region of around £85 million. And to give you a sense, you know, the breakdown over eastern, northern, southern and western areas is 10.2 eastern, 17.9 northern, 21.6 southern, and 20.6 Western area, so you know we're, we're optimistic where we are sitting at this point today, um, that we could some, come somewhere close to around eighty-five million. 
Okay, no, thank you. And I suppose then, I don't know whether it's a question for yourselves, but those that maybe won't get completed within this year, the, you know, the, the, the planned programme of works, will they then be put on hold to next year? They won't be put to the bottom of the list, I suppose, would be my concern that that font will be set aside. Maybe I can answer that. Okay, probably just get maybe touching on the whole uh, maintenance issue. Uh, you know, as Declan said, mm. Edward bid for 120 million. The minister bid for that was successful in getting it. And you're obviously aware of the, the legal issues affecting the trust number of the really area of the Delhi surface. And there's a lot of particular member, so clearly this is an impact our capacity uh, to deliver. I don't know if other members are having the same problem, but in the mm. room here, we, we can't hear anything that you're saying. And it's more to do, I think, with your connection as opposed to. Yeah, that's a better name. That's a better yeah. Try again. Better is that? What's that like? Try again. It's okay, Yeah. Just check it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay then, Chair? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can, Connor. Go on ahead. You're okay. Yeah, okay. Well, listen, I'll start again then. That, um, just come back to the start that the, the Minister bid for £120 million this year for structural maintenance and was successful in getting that. But you'll be aware of the, the legal issues we have uh, affecting contracts in four of, the 12 re, uh, four of the 12 areas that are covered by the resurfacing contracts. And there's another five contracts which are ending in November, so clearly all this impacts our capacity to deliver in a number of areas. And so what are we doing about it, I suppose? Well, we've recognised these problems, um, you know, that, 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 have, that we've encountered this year, and we're, we've come up with a new procurement strategy. Um, so instead of having 12 contacts, we're moving to 24, so we're, we want to have contracts that have a greater number, smaller areas, shorter terms and hopefully this reduces the risk of legal challenges going forward and much of those is, is come to, uh, uh, now later this year hopefully in January. but of course that leaves us with a problem this year that to acknowledge and as Declan said we're seeking to maximize our spend and this year to do three other and the use of Contact or rules, which are in the individual contract. Connor, can I can I ask? We we are having we're having extreme difficulties hearing you at the committee. Um, could you please turn off your video and use just audio? That might help. I'm feeling that. You can't hear us. Sorry. Could I ask DFI officials to Sorry. please mute their, mute their uh, line uh, while Connor speaks? We're having a lot of feedback on the line here. Uh, Connor, your, uh, your screen is now uh, just on to audio, which is good. We may be able to hear you. Do you want to try again? Okay. We're having connection difficulties. Apologies, Connor. Uh, what is but I would ask, could you, could you please put that response in writing? Because that was useful information. It would help the committee. Uh, but we're, we're going to move back on to, to another question here. Uh, but if you could supply that in writing. Uh, I just want to try and answer Liz's question that certainly schemes that, you know, that are affected this year that are on hold, they will certainly be part of the new contracts and will be top of the list when we get the new contracts in place as they roll out next year. So it's not that schemes are cancelled will go to the bottom list, they will still remain priority games and we'll be getting to them as soon as we can. Okay, that's better. We can hear that now. Liz, do you want to follow up? Yeah, no, thank you, Connor. And I mean, I suppose I, my, my next question was going to be just a wee bit more information on that, um, the new scheme that, that Connor has alluded to there, but certainly the information that I was able to get was helpful. Chair, I just have one other question, I was, if possible, it's just around the A1 project, and obviously I had um, mentioned it in previous meetings as well. Um, and we were told that once the orders and business case was made, then a conversation would have to be ha had with the minister about 
her priorities in relationship to this. I was just wondering if, if the officials could provide a comment on that and whether there has been any further consideration given to this project within the current budget because it is it is a crucial one and we are keen to see it pressing ahead as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, and I think that's a point. If nobody wishes to respond, can come back. I think it was more for comment. Um, okay, we move on now to uh, Andrew Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the officials uh, for coming to the committee. Um, just, <clears throat> just three things, and, and very briefly, really, to be honest. Um, I think I would share the disappointment from other members that there's no bid within the monitoring round for road resurfacing. Um, the bids for uh, road resurfacing within monitoring rounds is uh, a very clear uh, sort of feature of monitoring rounds from time and memoriam, really, to be honest. And the fact that, that, that there isn't significant bids for that is disappointing because I know many areas, including my own constituency, are in desperate need for action in relation to roads and pavements. Um, but obviously, we're conscious of the procurement issues that have arisen in relation to that. I would like to have an understanding if there's any potential that there will be a surrender of any budgets in relation to road resurfacing at the end of the financial year in light of the procurement issues that have uh, uh, taken place. So that's uh, the first question. The second one is that um, the bids within this monitoring round are very much completely unusual. Obviously, we're in unprecedented times, but there's significant, and I mean significant, bids here for uh, for support to TransLink and also to NI Water. Um, and the, the bids are also, from my understanding, are quite critical in terms of NI Water and electricity costs as Northern Ireland's biggest consumer, and also TransLink in relation to operating costs. And I'd just like to have an understanding that if these bids aren't met in full, what would the impact be both upon Northern Ireland Water and TransLink? Because I've never really seen such significant bids in my time uh, for the, both of the uh, non-departmental public bodies, and I'm concerned if they are met, what the impact would that be uh, on frontline services for the citizens of Northern Ireland? Okay. And over now to officials, who wants to take that one? Yeah. I'm happy to comment on the first point. Um, certainly, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can indeed, Connor. Yeah. Okay. Well, 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 I think it's worth saying that I mean, the minister and we too are disappointed that we're we're not in a, a position to be bidding for more funding for for our maintenance. But uh, I think it's acknowledged that uh, the difficult year that it is, and yeah, and that we won't be able to, be able to fully spend the 120 million for 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 reasons many of which are outside our control. Um, I think. Best guess at the minute is that we're looking at 80 to 90 million of that, and I think the other statement I said earlier that you know the capital budget is managed at a departmental level, and there are a number of cert uncertainties across a number of areas. Uh, and as I understand it, in light of these various issues, there's no bid for funding, nor indeed is there any identification at this time of any reduced requirements. Okay. Yeah, maybe if I just come back on that, Connor. Um, the, the issue is it's not impacting only upon citizens of Northern Ireland, but also upon employment, because you know there are lots of companies who re rely on the contracts in relation to this. So, you know, I think we, I, I can't express how much disappointed I am in relation to this situation. Um, that, that, you know, it's not that there hasn't been previous reports documenting the need for investment in this area, that there has been. Um, and, you know, if there isn't a, an ability to proceed with procure, uh, procurement contracts in some council areas, there's most certainly a need, an ability to be able to proceed in other areas. And, and the, the, the department has a list of projects that could proceed in different council areas. So the, the real disappointment in relation to this, you know, it, it, this is something that's often raised to me really in the state of, and this isn't just around vehicle traffic, you know, cyclists cycling along roads uh, and actually being thrown off their bicycles because of the state of our roads and the lack of the departmental action in relation to that. So I am very disappointed to be hearing figures of 80 to 90 million pounds. Uh, no, uh, I would agree with them is that we know what the need is out there and we want to be addressing it, but obviously there's this year, and I think that's really why we've had a good look at our procurement strategy, because what we had was 12 contracts, 12 areas of longer terms, 
uh, and then we, we've had legal challenges on a number of those. So we're now moving to, to 24, um, which is, is a smaller terms, smaller areas, and hopefully that reduces the risk of legal challenges to contract awards, but obviously only, only time will tell. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So you're going to pick up the Translink more now, water point? Okay, yeah, so just <coughs> turning to the second point and the impact um, on Translink and MI Water, if the significant boots put forward aren't actually met. So looking to MI Water first, so that bid is primarily in relation to electricity um, and those increasing energy costs, which again are fluctuating quite significantly. Um, and really it's also inescapable, um, so there's nothing really that can be done to avoid those costs. So NI Water then will need to look, and we'll be engaging with NI Water as well, to see what actions need to be taken to live within budget um, up to the end of this financial year if the bid is unsuccessful. And, and unfortunately, the impact of energy costs does affect many other um, departments and indeed citizens and households as well. So it's one that's uniquely recognised um, too. In relation to TransLink, again, members will be aware that last financial year, TransLink did receive um, an additional amount of funding um, to replace the historic underfunding as well. So the pressures that have been put, put forward are really to address the in-year um, anticipated loss. So again, within the department, we will work with TransLink to see how the overall position is managed, bearing in mind that additional 50 million was received last year um, for reserves as well. Yeah, th thank you for that. Just, just coming back, and conscious other members have questions, but see, in relation to uh, the NI water situation, you're, you're completely correct that th this, these are inescapable uh, demands, but have you got any indication back from NI water of what their alternative plans would be if the, these bids aren't met? We don't have that detail as of yet, and that is something that we will work through with NI water um, whenever we get the outcome of this monitoring round. Right? And again, we need just to carefully manage the energy prices and see if they're continuing to rise or if there's any stabilising prices as well. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And thank you much, Chair. Uh, just one thing I was going to suggest is that um, at every monitor round, we get this paper through from yourselves and it details what your bids are, OK? And then they, we get a, an outcome of the monitor round and we don't really come back to it here in the committee. Okay, so what generally happens is you bid for all this and you don't get an awful lot of it. Okay, uh, and uh, then the, the, there's no that's where the most important discussion occurs, which is like, so what's the impact of not being met in terms of monitoring rounds? So I was going to suggest that once the uh, the monitoring round is completed and is published, that we invite you back to have a discussion in relation to what the impact has been uh, in terms of whether those bids were met or not met, because that's an important discussion to have uh, rather than leaving it to the end of the financial year when the situation is actually then um, sort of played out in terms of public services. So I don't know whether the committee would be content with that, but I just think that would be an informed discussion to have in terms of what's happened as a result of the bids, whether they're met or not. Yeah, we can come back to that point at the end of the briefing, but thank you, Andrew. Uh, we'll go to Cal Boylan now and then Roy Beggs. Thank you, Chair, and to the welcome, uh, Declan Connor and Susan. Um, probably most of the uh, questions is directed to, excuse me, my chair, I'm throwing this off here. Sorry. Um, most of the questions are directed to probably Declan and Susan. Just in terms of current reserves for the for the DVA, NA Water and TransLink, um, could you give us an indication what those reserves are? In relation to, and I know the question has been answered a wee bit in relation to the energy prices, what are the total amount of costs for the, those raising energy prices? Uh, besides being an NIW, what, for the department, what are the total costs? Uh, my third point would be in relation to the COVID pressures. Um, is there any difference in relation to your previous projections? Is it better or worse now? That, is the situation worse than you previously thought? If you can answer those three points and then another two quick points, please. Thank you. Mr. Boyne, uh, thank you for the questions. We, we, we will be able to answer the questions on reserves and the total cost of electricity at this point, but we will follow that up immediately after this meeting. Um, on, on COVID more, more generally, um, we're, we're seeing an improved picture, particularly for TransLink and Strangford Ferry and Rathlin, et cetera, where we're starting to see more passenger uptake. So that, that's putting us in a more positive position going forward and, and, and hopefully that 
that will continue in the, in the weeks and months ahead, particularly as we head into the winter months. So it, generally, it seems like the situation is improving, and certainly that's been reflected to us um, by TransLink and, and the other service providers. So I think I think we're on the trajectory, which is positive insofar as people returning back to use the services, and hopefully that will lessen the gap of what we need to bid for in, in future monitoring rounds. No, and I appreciate that. I mean, uh, you know, you can write back to the committee in, in, in the other two questions. Just, just going on then from that, Declan, see in terms of there's been an uplift there. See the way DVA, obviously they're under pressure, but now there's been an uplift in terms of, of business. I mean, can you comment in relation to that? How, how has that increased in terms of the DVA operations? Okay, yeah. So in terms of DVA operations, um, really the loss has been shown up to the end of August. Um, so after that, then this, the working assumption has been that it will be turned to full capacity. So that's the assumptions that currently have been factored into the pressure just that we've been put forward. But again, that will be monitored um, throughout the rest of the year. Right, as is increased sound. And my final point then, obviously, at a previous meeting, the uh, officials mentioned a £56 million bid to replace uh, the Connecting Europe Facility Funding. Can we have an update on that bid um, at present, please? And what could that funding be ideally used for? Or maybe you'll have to write that into us or, or send to the committee? Yeah, that's in relation to EU funding. I would it was. Yeah, we'll, funds, yeah, we'll, we'll follow that up at this point. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And can I now move on to Roy Beggs? <coughs> Yeah, thanks for the update. Uh, I, I just want to be clear of what was said. I, I, I like others, I'm very disappointed that um, there's no bids for increasing structural maintenance given the, the defects that are on our roads. Um, you've indicated that uh, you only plan to spend 80, 85 million this year. Um, and if I picked it up right, did you say that five more contracts were coming to the end of November? And this was restricting your ability to, to bid. Is that correct? So Connor can give on that? Yeah. Yeah, there, there, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's 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 five that contracts. Yeah, there, there, there's four that are impacted by the, the legal challenge and there's five that um, expire in November, but you know, we'll obviously be completing schemes and Claims schemes have started uh, before our contract finishes, but then we also have the new tranche of schemes coming out we'll go through, we'll go through the tender process shortly. So we'll expect replacement uh, contracts um, um, in, in the new year, certainly the first tranche of our of six schemes we're, we're hoping to award those uh, in January. Can, can I ask why on earth is the new contract in place months before the old one runs out? Because uh, we are missing a huge opportunity to improve our road structures. And this is also impacting on people's lives. Those workers will not have work and will be laid off when there's something urgently need done. This, this, why does the new contract not kick in and be sitting ready before the old one runs out? Well, well with all we, you know, we have to go through due process on them and go through a tendering process, which we um, are doing and we, ha we have done, obviously, in the four contracts where we've had the legal challenge, but unfortunately we haven't been able to implement those and get them on the ground. Um, and certainly the, the new co contracts that are coming out in January, there will be six new ones. Uh, so hopefully we will be able to spend under those contracts in the, the current financial year and we'll reflect that. We'll consider that as part of January monitoring. I mean, I appreciate there's been the legal uh, difficulty in having the retender for those four contracts, but looking at the five, why does the department not schedule the tendering process so it is completed before the next, the, the previous contract runs out, and give some degree of overlap so that so that uh, you're not caught out like this? This is, this strikes me as being incompetent. I have to say, what? Why is there a gap of contractor? Will, will we, we can't have overlaps on, on contracts so, sorry, which uh, works I, carried out with um, why, why do we not have the one contractor in place notified months before the old contract runs out? So on day one of the new period, you have a contractor in place? Well, uh, obviously we're moving from 12 contracts to, to 24. We're, we're implementing a new uh, procurement strategy. So there's obviously... With four contracts, there's a uh, uh, risk of force 
to do that in terms of putting the contracts in place. Mr. Chairman, if that was a private company, it'd be out of business. I mean, you're you're cutting off work for months because you haven't scheduled your tendering process. This is ridiculous, and, and I, I just fail to understand this. And we need to delve further into how the, the procurement process operates. Okay, well we can uh, yeah. we can come back okay. on that. Uh, in, in terms of Northern Ireland Water, um, we're aware of huge expenditure uh, being needed uh, to upgrade our. Uh, sewage systems and our water pipes. Now, I appreciate uh, there's difficulty spending money in that mid-year uh, in that contracts have to be issued, designs have to be made, etc., etc. But are there not uh, at least uh, some stock items that could be purchased, whether it's uh, uh, equipment for pumping stations, whether it is pipe work that can be put in stock so that they are sitting ready for uh, as soon as work is available, so that money can be usefully drawn down for Northern Ireland Water, uh, and, and did you not consider a bid for that? Uh, I think, uh, we, Mr. Beggs, we'd be very much guided by Northern Ireland Water and their plans uh, for, for um, purchasing equipment, etc. And so we would work very closely with them, and, and they, would have, they have a very clear plan schedule of how they're going to manage their budget throughout the year. So, so we. we work closely with them on that so you know we would take our lead from them insofar as what they feel is appropriate to buy and when and, and because as with most machinery some of it can go become obsolete before we even use it so it's about buying at the right time to use it at the right time so um you know we, we would really very much take our lead from northern Island water on what they think is the right time to buy things and if i can maybe also just add that this financial year we've actually funded the capital requirements and the price control determination plus a further 15 million of contingency projects as well. So there has been an uplift compared to what was set out in the PC21 um, determination until the regulator's determination. So we have engaged with MI Water on that point um, to allocate that further 15 million. Okay, we're, we're, we're moving on. I'll, I'll go to, to Patrick um, for a question. So thank you for your answer so far. In your briefing, you state that there are two technical Reduced requirements totaling 0.27 million. The department are returning to the Department of Finance. Are you able to expand on that point and exactly why they have to be returned? I'm wondering, on a wider point, can you explain the circumstances when the department doesn't have to return that and when instead it can be used to fund other areas? Uh, chair, chair we, apologies, we were unable to get the members' question there. Okay, do you want to re we repeat? Go on ahead, Henry. Uh, the briefing states that there are two technical reduced requirements totalling 0.27 million that the department are returning to the Department of Finance. So are you able to expand on that point and explain exactly the circumstances in which those have been returned to the Department of Finance? And on a wider point, can you explain <coughs> any circumstances in which the department doesn't have to return the spend and it can instead be used to fund other areas? Thank you for repeating that. Um, we'll pass to Susan. Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, the two technical reduced requirements are items which we must return to the Department of Finance in line with the monitoring guidelines. So these are very, very specific amounts. So I think that the largest amount is not quite two, it's 200,000 in relation to an over accrual. So that was an amount that we had um, scored in last year's budget. Um, and then whenever the actual invoices have come through, they have been less than what we have approved. And we can't use that balance to fund any expenditure in this, this year, and we must return it back. And that's just us following the monitoring guidelines. And Anything else then that we would have to return to DOF be those items which would be ring fenced um, or earmarked specifically for areas um, that the executive has allocated funding for. And for our department, um, things like our flagship projects would fall into that category. So in capital, we can't use any flagship funding to fund other areas within our capital budget. We must return that back um, for an executive decision on reallocation. So those are really the key areas um, within our current budget. Okay. Just another point, um, in our correspondence with the department, there, it states that you're looking at a grant scheme to help reservoir managers to make sure that their reservoirs are safer. Has any funding been put aside this year for that grant scheme? Sorry, I missed the last part of that. Repeat. 
Has any funding been put aside this year for the grant scheme? Uh, the grant scheme is part of the wider reservoirs package is something that will be consulted upon in, in, in due course. As you know, we, we took responsibility from the 2nd of June for the Reservoirs Act and um, we're now working through next steps. Um, it, it's un unlikely that, that there would be a grant scheme in, in operation any time during this financial year. It's likely to be something in the next mandate. Um, not least because we'd have to go out and consult, etc., on what is the best way forward. So, so, in short, the answer would be there would be no money set aside for a grant scheme in this in this financial year. Okay. Have been enough. Yeah. Uh, there's just another two points there, if I can make briefly. Um, regarding the blue green fund, uh, I noticed that a large proportion of the funding wasn't spent last year. Um, and I wanted to know where that funding was re redirected and I suppose my concern from that is coming from the fact that this year the same funding has been allocated and if it's not going to be used it would be preferable to put that into you know, the likes of green initiatives like cycle lanes which are desperately needed across the north, particularly in areas like the north west. Okay, so I'll pick up on the first point and then maybe hand over to Connor in relation to the roads element um, of this current year's budget. So in relation to the underspend last financial year, again as I've outlined previously, we manage the overall capital budget at a totality level, um, so we don't necessarily take an underspend from one area and redirect it elsewhere, but um, members will be aware our outturn um, for last year on capital was significant. We only had a very, very small underspend, um, so we did do our best to maximise capital expenditure for last financial year. And as you outlined this financial year, there's an all capital allocation of 20 million um, for Blue Green, of which 10 million is being delivered um, on the roadside. And Connor, could you maybe pick up on the second point of that question? Yeah, well, well uh, yeah, the, if you put it to 10 million of the, the 20 million on our side, and as I understand it, uh, the, the expectation is that it'll fully spend out on, on, on Green Blue this year, the, the full 20 million pounds will be, be spent. Okay. Yeah, just a final point. Uh, I see that the A5, I know that it's received some funding in the June monitoring round. I wonder could you detail what that's gone towards? Um, and I think that it's really important that that money is being spent properly by the department to make sure that when work's finally commenced, that we're ready to go. Do we have anybody to respond? Uh, I think we'll probably have to come back to that uh, in writing. Okay. Right, no, it, sorry, if I can just clarify that point. Brief, Connor. Briefly, please. Uh, all I wanted to know was where that spend has been, uh, what, what has been done with that money. I mean, it's, it was on the June monitoring round, so I want to know where the funding has gone towards. It's a pretty straightforward element. Do we have anybody to come back in that particular? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to say we need to take that and come okay. back to committee. Right, well, there's been a number of issues, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that one. I just want to ask finally uh, George Robinson if he has a question, because I know he has had trouble uh, with the hand icon. George, do you have a question? Sorry if I've missed you, because you're not coming up on my screen. Okay. George doesn't have a question, I don't see him on the screen. Okay, can I thank officials, can I just say that it's been an extremely difficult meeting uh, from a technical point of view more than anything. Uh, we'll have to ensure that this doesn't happen again and if that can be that, that officials are here in person, we'll have to put arrangements in place to, to make sure that that happens. So uh, can I thank officials and again uh, we will follow up on a couple of points in writing to you following uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Members back up on the screen. Yep, yep. Okay, members, um, I suppose that was a very, very difficult briefing to follow, I found anyway, here in terms of the connection perspective, and I'm sure you were probably 
no different. Uh, I think there was some detail there that was scant, to say the least, and, and some aspects from some members' questions. Um, I think Andrew raised a good point uh, about a follow-up on this uh, following the monitoring round outcome. Um, I think that, that would be useful, uh, and if committees in agreement, we can we can proceed in that direction. Roy had asked particularly about procurement. I think there was issues there that potentially, you know, certainly merits further discussion and improvement by the committee. So, so we can look into that issue as well, and also some issues that weren't addressed by officials. Hopefully, now I can follow up in writing to us. Um, again, it just stresses the point that we need officials in the room to be able to go through this type of briefing, uh, and we'll ensure that that happens in the future. Okay, members. So moving on, you know, we now have a, another briefing uh, from the roads, haulage, and logistics se sector. I think they're on the line. We're just checking to see if we can get them on the line, members. So the briefing at page two five five. Briefing papers from the Road Haulage Association. Okay, and I'm seeing some some members coming up online. Okay, all members are online. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, firstly, can I welcome uh, attending via Starleaf, uh, Mr. Seamus, uh, Policy Manager, uh, Seamus Lahenny, Policy Manager for Northern Ireland uh, Logistics UK, and uh, Mrs. Justine McGreevy, uh, Training and Development Manager, Henderson Group. Mr. John Martin, Policy Manager, Northern Ireland Road Haulage Association. Mr. Chris Slowley, Director of Manfred, uh, and Mr. Stephen Hazley, uh, Fleet Manager at Manfred. Can I welcome you all to today's meeting? Uh, this is an issue now uh, of national concern. Uh, it is of concern here to us as a committee. We, we recognise the, the, the severe difficulties and shortages the industry, the logistics and haulage industry, is facing globally. Uh, and I suppose uh, our purpose for writing to you to come to the committee today was to outline to the committee, uh, in your view, what are the main issues facing the sector and, more importantly, what can government do to help? So, without further ado, could I ask uh, whoever is giving the initial briefing to begin? Thank you. Okay, Mr Chair, I suppose um, I'll start. Um, I'm Seamus Lehenny, Policy Manager for Northern Ireland at Logistics UK. Um, thank you very much for inviting the members um, of the industry here to speak on behalf of the committee this morning. Um, you're quite right, this is a, a national issue affecting uh, the whole of the UK. Um, at the moment, really, the figures that Logistics UK, the research that we've done, we would um, put the, the median figure of the shortage of drivers across the UK at around about 76,000 drivers um, required. Um, we conducted a survey with our national membership uh, in September, and 96% of respondents uh, said that they had difficulty in recruiting drivers. Um, so we would have about 18,000 members spread right across the UK, um, around about approximately about 400 here in Northern Ireland, and they're from the own account sector, so it's people who make stuff, move their own goods, um, right across uh, then to the logistics sector, people who carry other people's goods. Um, there's a lot of talk happening both uh, politically and in the media about the causes for this. Probably um, the long-term cause, this isn't something that's just happened overnight. Um, it's a problem that's grown over a number of years and, and really hasn't been addressed properly um, by government. Um, primarily, probably the four key things that's, that's led us to where we are today is that there's a, certainly a lack of young drivers entering the market. Probably in Northern Ireland here, we average, I think it's less than 2% of um, HGV drivers are under the age of 25, and there's, there's numerous reasons for that, insurance being one, but also just young people being attracted into the, into the industry as well. And that's down to, I suppose, um, the, the lack of visibility of the industry. I think the logistics industry, um, it hasn't really got the credit that it deserves until really um, we were faced with COVID. And then we've seen then the logistics industry was deemed essential workers. And certainly we were the industry that kept supply chains functioning. We kept shops stopped, um, shops stocked, hospitals um, kitted out with what they needed. And then we go down then to basically the per facilities as well. So there's always been a lack really of um, proper parking facilities, access for drivers, safe, secure parking facilities. And then fundamentally as well, we, um, as, as an industry, unlike most industries, we have an over-reliance on half the population to staff us because the, the logistics industry, especially with drivers, is overwhelmingly male. 
Um, less than 1% of um, qualified drivers in Northern Ireland are female. And you can put that down to a number of, of reasons, maybe the perception of the industry, uh, facilities, the lack of facilities as well, like wash, toilet facilities, safe, secure parking. And when we compare somewhere like the UK, where around about 1% of drivers are female, when we look at countries like Sweden, um, Sweden has around about 10% of HGV drivers who are female, and that's down to them having the infrastructure that, that caters for female drivers. And probably more fundamentally, um, free childcare for those workers as well, so that they can um, obviously have a, have a family life that revolves around their work life as well. One doesn't hinder the other. So um, that's a quick overview for me, uh, and uh, I'll pass over to my other learned colleagues here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chair, Chairperson, um, thank you very much for inviting us uh, today to give the committee some information in relation to the current shortage of HGV drivers. I would totally concur with everything that Seamus has said, uh, and I won't repeat anything that he has said uh, because it's all relevant. There's a few additional things I would add, is that uh, some of the contributory factors to the shortage uh, due to COVID um, within Northern Ireland the DVA lost 2,400 HGV tests. Now, I have been speaking to DVA and they have indicated that they have increased the number of tests to, uh, to in the region of 1,200 per quarter. Even with that significant increase, and we welcome that increase and that focus on HGV tests, it will take at least 12 to 15 months to claw back the lost slots. And whenever you take into consideration the estimated shortage of HGV drivers within Northern Ireland is in the region of um, four to 5,000, that's a significant number that we lost. So it's half the shortage could be made up of all those drivers took up HGV positions. As I say, in addition to what uh, um, uh, uh, Seamus has already indicated, another factor is the whole logistics supply chain is a lot slower and less efficient than what it was 12 to 18 months ago. And there's a number of factors that contribute to that. Uh, one is uh, the, the new trading arrangements between GB and Northern Ireland, that has slowed down the logistics chain. And the result is that trucks are coming over to Northern Ireland with less product and that they're maybe only 50 to 75% full. So there's a loss of capacity within the sector. And in addition to that, there's considerable delays at a lot of the major re regional distribution centres. Truck drivers could roll up at a regional distribution centre and maybe sit for anything up to four to six hours until he's given a slot to offload. And there's a number of reasons for that, uh, partly down to maybe a lack of warehouse staff, etc., to uh, unload the vehicles. But that is, again, losing capacity within the sector and all has a knock-on effect on the efficiency and the ability of the sector to deliver. As you all know, Northern Ireland exports a lot of product and imports a lot of product. All that depends on an efficient and effective just-in-time logistics sector. If we don't have that and we don't have the drivers to, to staff that up, then it affects everybody and everything. And that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Good morning. Um, it's Justine McGreevy. I'm the Training Development Manager for the Henderson Group. Um, I suppose just in terms of the pressures that we felt as an organisation, um, we haven't suffered the same degree of um, challenges with regard to access to drivers, we have quite a stable workforce um, at the moment, but they are a maturing workforce and we see our big challenges coming with um, the recruitment pipeline. Um, so we do do some work internally, which helps support that, um, but it is the attraction of young people um, to the logistics sector. Um, largely the speed of applying for a license to the time when you pass your test to be able to move into employment uh, typically can take around four months, four to five months. Um, and then there's also significant cost um, associated with that, which for a young person moving into that kind of industry it is a huge challenge um, comparative to, for example, 
uh, where there's skill shortages in nursing. If you want to move into uh, become a nurse, you're fully funded uh, for, for the duration of your training. Um, we're also seeing increased market competition, obviously, for drivers uh, with a smaller labour pool. Um, and rates of pay then, <clears throat> in addition, they are being pushed up. Um, and that's challenging for businesses um, as well, and certainly moving forward. Um, and we, as a, as a business, obviously, who are supplying to consumers, um, products, we have had challenges with uh, supply into our business because our suppliers are suffering from the driver shortages and we have had to go and collect product because our inbound service, um, the service levels have fallen significantly. So that's impacting not only on us, but on our um, end consumer. Thank you. Good morning, committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you directly today. My name is Chris Slowey. I am the Managing Director and Owner of Manfield, a company based in Portadown, Northern Ireland. Today we employ close to 400 people and we work with main retailers across GB. Uh, unlike Justine, our export into GB market and import, so we don't have really much volume around the doors at home. Uh, you've asked what can you do to help us as an industry? We as an industry ourselves, as Justine's company have as well, established our own academy for training people to get them through their licences. We did that six years ago and we're putting through today between three to four people per month of our own at a cost to our business. Um, we've had to do that in conjunction with our insurers. So our insurers effectively have recognised the skill set that's gained by training through our business and given the driver the opportunity to go and drive for us um, unshadowed within about three months of training, which means that we bring new people into the industry. John and Seamus have touched on ladies. There is no incentive for ladies to get involved in the industry. We as a business have we're now recruiting lady drivers and have six on the books today as we have. Of that six, uh, it would be 224 full-time drivers and 72 part-time drivers. Average age is 56 years of age. I was born in this industry, so was my father in the business before me. I travelled the globe with my father and his industry and his business in my youth, which was a long time ago. But even back then, I seen that the Dutch and the Danes were already uh, putting drivers through an academy, like a military academy, that a driver in Denmark and driver in Holland has the ability not just to drive the vehicle, but to maintain the vehicle to a certain standard. Thus, his recognition as seen as professional. We as an industry recruit put three licenses, give them a CPC card and do an annual classroom day with them. But they are not recognised in the wider perspective as being professional people, such as nurses, police officers and firemen, but they have their unique skill set. In the south of Ireland, about four years ago, they went into having an academy in Coothill, County Cavan, where they actually brought candidates and put them in through a 12-month programme and gave them a skill set, not just in logistics, but on the different practicalities and logistics such as tankers, such as tippers, such as walking floors, such as fridges. All are quite unique, although it's a trailer pulled behind a lorry, each has a different skill set and knowledge base needed to complete the tasks in the day without causing our ministry cost and injury. So what I would suggest to you is come and be with ourselves, Henderson's ourselves, see what we do to promote our industry, not just um, locally, but nationally, we promote ourselves. We have actually have a media team of our own, marketing media, to promote us as industry because it is a good industry organ. Recognise that Northern Ireland is an export market and we don't have vehicles and drivers. We don't have product even the shores of Ireland and we have a problem with our economy. Take initiative from ourselves and work together to give drivers accreditation and also a progression path within the industry that they don't feel they come into this role and that they're capped at that level, that they have opportunity to go into a planning stage or into workshop stages or into training stages. This is what we do in our business, to try and help progress and develop the individual and give them ambition to develop. So as a committee, asking you bluntly, it's recognition that this is an industry you need for our economy. Give us an academy. We'll contribute to it um, from a collective of companies towards the run of the cost. Gives us a skill set individual entering our industry that has ability to complete the tasks, to go out to the marketplace and deliver the goods, and we can manage them and they're developing from there. Okay. 
Okay, can I thank you all for your presentation? Uh, it was very, very useful, and particularly um, nice to hear solution mode as well in relation to a training academy and how how that could help the industry in the longer term. We also want to recognise as a committee the, the, the very hard work that was done by your industry and indeed drivers through what was a very, very difficult time. Uh, many people look towards uh, our um, healthcare staff and indeed our, our emergency services who've done a fantastic job, but also sometimes, sadly, our HGV drivers and our hauliers can be overlooked on, on what was an essential task. Uh, to, to keep food on the shelves uh, and keep the population fed and warm uh, during a very difficult period. Um, I suppose there, there's many reasons, and, and uh, as we, we do have a limited time to talk about it here today, but there's many reasons that it's a cocktail, a poisonous cocktail that has come to the position in shortages of HGV, dri HGV drivers. Um, one issue in which I'm constantly hearing, and indeed when I look online and look at statistics, uh, one of the main reasons cited is the retirement of the, it's a, a, a largely older male workforce uh, that are moving into retirement, uh, and they cite, and those that I talk to, about the added bureaucracy now involved, uh, and the, the life conditions just aren't what they used to be. Now, notwithstanding the difficulties that the supply chain is facing due to issues such as the Northern Ireland Protocol and how, uh, for example, backloads are, are sitting in stations because shelves or staff are not there, can I ask, um, well, how, how, do you, how is additional bureaucracy in the system impacting upon the desire for people to get involved uh, as an HGV driver? Can I answer that, John, from the point of view? From our point of view, from our point of view, <clears throat> today we run 200 vehicles, which is units uh, operating across the Irish Channel, delivering the GB marketplace. In the month of January, we've seen an 18 percent reduction in our turnover daily. So we did based on um, export, import, and balance, which was leading from bureaucracy on misunderstanding of how movement of goods was to happen. <clears throat> we recovered that in February to about 12 percent. But today we operate about 9% additional fleet more than we need because of delays at borders, collection points, and also with the COVID, with the drivers not having to be able to share cabs. So it's had a massive effect on us financial sort hands. I would estimate this one time close to £380,000 from January's cost us. Okay, but is that affecting drivers entering the industry yeah. uh, as a driver? Yeah, it has. Has. We we would have had principally Scotch and Northern Ireland drivers before uh, Brexit. Uh, the Northern Ireland drivers, due to delays of having to take anything from 11 to 18 hour break between journey, collection and delivery, come home again, the Northern Ireland driver does not wish to go to GB any longer. So we've had to go to England to recruit in England and we've since Brexit, we've recruited 67 more drivers between Hollyhead and Birkenhead to replace the Northern Ireland drivers who don't want to go across the channel anymore because it's an unknown when they would come again. Before Brexit, we were a code called a foreign one company where we had pit stops. The driver took a 9-11 hour break in GB. He knew before going out where he's going to be backloading from. He knew when he bought Bodie be back home on. But the uncertainty and the drop in volume import-export has resulted in drivers are having greater delays. Facilities in GB are dismal, to say the least. You know, if you actually were to go to service stations in GB and see what they're expected to use and pay to use, you would be disgusted, I feel. So the satisfaction of industry, there has been polls put out by both the Justice UK and RIT on driver satisfaction and how their, their, their job is going. Us ourselves, our average age is 56 years of age. Our oldest person driving for us is 74 years of age. He's had a quadruple heart bypass and he came to work for us in 1998 with three lorries. He's here ever since. He is one of the backbones of our business because he has knowledge of our industry. His attitude towards the work and the customers is inspiring. So there is good men in our industry and we have a generation there who have stayed committed to our business and stayed committed to our industry and deliver every day for us. But we have a severe backdraft coming of an age group from 20 to 32, where that attitude is now where they fell into the trap of, um, I want to say, um, the internet, that they think that they can get jobs online, that they can work from a keypad, that they don't want to have to get sweaty. You know, that the last 12 years, I'm going to say honestly, that has changed the attitude from driving. For me, I grew up, a driver seen as professional, where he was given respect, he was admired for how he kept his vehicle. 
in the last 12 to 20 years, we have seen that attitude drop off because people don't want to get involved in logistics. They don't recognize it for what it is. Like our cabs that we buy today have 23 computers on it, which we can monitor every part of their behavior and the performance of the truck. The trucks are fully kitted with microwaves, coffee makers, fridges, freezers. You know, if we actually have partnered with Lurk College to try and show the young candidates coming through Lurk College that there's other sectors other than going into the university sector, that they can get a progression path and can earn, like Justin Yule could confirm for us the wages that Northern Ireland drivers are getting paid at the moment to be from £700 pound take home to £1,000 pound take home per week. So it's not a poorly paid industry now. It has raised in the last 12 months by about 11, 12% of wages, but it's a good paying job for what it seemed to be a very poor player. It is also a good environment to work with them because the people that you work with are generally working as a team, in fact. But Brexit has pushed the drivers from going cross channel, um, and that's why we've had to go to England to recruit. And I'm sorry to cut across you, Chris, because we, we will be tight on time. But I suppose to, to get most out of this, I understand there's a significant overlap between what we can do as a committee for infrastructure and indeed the, commi or the committee for the economy. And maybe that's a conversation that we can have how uh, we can have a sort of a joint session to, to look at the challenges facing the industry. Very encouraging to hear what you're trying to do uh, and the need to get young women into the industry uh, and putting in conditions in place. Uh, purely on the issue from, from our perspective, um, you know, you note in the briefing that the DVA would need to, to be testing 1,000 HGV drivers per quarter rather than the usual 700 per year. Funny, this is an issue in which the department don't really raise with ourselves that testing hasn't been an issue for HGV. So I know it's, it's what's needed, but does the sector think that this is achievable? And if not, um, what do they think would be an achievable number? You will note also in England, I think in, in Wales, there was a, um, a new ch a char or a new or, or change to the trailer testing to enable them to ramp up um, testing for HGV. This is something that's what the minister has indicated probably won't be introduced here. Does the industry believe that that's a, a practical way to drive up testing uh, in the HGV sector? Thank you, Sorry, Justin, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just um, speak um, on behalf of uh, yeah. the ones again, um, what we would be really keen to see is um, the opportunity to have delegated driver examiners. So um, our academy could have somebody that is a designated examiner to support the DVA um, in uh, helping people to achieve their 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 tests. Um, now, that is obviously in place in England. Uh, the legislation over here is different, and so that is not a facility that we can avail of currently. But we would see that as an opportunity for us to really help support the DVA um, to uh, clear, help to clear that backlog and help us as an organisation to recruit people in. Okay. Anyone else? Sir? If I could come in, maybe there, Chairman. I have engaged with DVA you know, later than this week in relation to their throughput because it was an initial concern of mine and the sectors. And they have assured me that they are throwing a lot of resources at it. And as I indicated earlier, uh, in the most recent quarter, they tested 1,300 HCV tests uh, drivers. So that is a considerable increase. And based on the anticipated backlog, it would take them roughly 12 months. Certainly, as an association, I wouldn't support reducing the quality of the test, like removing the trailer aspect or the reversing aspect of the test. There could be a streamlining of the testing process and go back to what it was previously. In other words, you don't have to do your Category C before you do your Category C plus E. Uh, I think that could be a suggestion. Also, in relation to driver CPC, uh, if there was some relaxation or extension of existing uh, CPC um, qualifications that may attract some people back in, particularly the older generation who see that as an obstacle as opposed to uh, an assistance. But I would suggest that maybe the department could take the lead in setting up a small task force um, supported by the, the true trade bodies and some of the leading organisations or some of the leading hauliers to see if we can work our way through this difficulty because it's an issue that's not going away in the short term. 
And Chairman, if I just quickly just add as well to the three previous contributions, I think um, the, the DVA um, have been working hard now, credit, credit to them. I think um, the number of tests uh, for the last, from the 23rd of April forward, I think it's a 65% higher than, than the period for the five year average beforehand. So. I suppose they're limited to the number of examiners that they have. Now, what, what the committee can do, I have been told um, that the DVA have budgeted around about £18,000 um, set aside to train new examiners. Um, so there will be new um, HGV driving examiners um, that should be um, available from January to uh, next year onwards. So that will help with the capacity. Probably if the committee can just look at about, um, there is three locations, new buildings, Portadown and Belfast for testing. Maybe if we can add to that, I know that there is limitations in current scope, but uh, it would be good to broaden that out as well. Uh, and probably the last thing you, you mentioned about, obviously, the overlap with, with, with the committee and the department. Um, you're right, the Department for Economy has a part to play here, specifically around the Northern Ireland apprenticeships. Um, we need a fully funded all age apprenticeship for HGV driving. I know the discussions are ongoing and um, certainly I think the support of the committee, um, if representation can be made to the economy minister on that, that we need a movement on that urgently. And probably the last thing I would say is a shortage occupation list. I know the Scottish government are looking at this. Um, a big problem is that the, the annual population survey shows that 16,000 EU drivers left the UK uh, in the year up to March this year. That's down to COVID and Brexit. Brexit has played a part in this, uh, make no mistake, because um, driving is classed as a level two skill. The new immigration rules that the UK and the Home Office introduced says you cannot get a visa to work here if you're a HGV driver. So the ability for businesses here to go and recruit drivers um, who from, from continental Europe to come and work here, which has been a lifeline for years, that's not available anymore now. Um, so we need to get driving recognised as an essential skill. If we can get a regional shortage occupation list for Northern Ireland, I know that's something the Scottish Government is exploring. I think that is something and obviously a skill we could put on to that list. Okay, and I know we're, we're going to be tight for time here to get all members in. Uh, there's quite a few that want to ask questions. So I'm going to go now to members, and I would ask, please, that you keep your points brief and succinct. <coughs> and alternatively, if we can have one single response from an individual, whoever from the panel feels best place to answer, that means we can get through the questions in the time allocated. So firstly, I'm going to go to Liz Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and I will keep it brief. And Seamus has kind of touched on some of the stuff I was going to ask there just in his, his closing comments. And it is, it's in relation to, to those barriers about trying to get EU drivers to fill the urgent vacancies. I mean, you, you mentioned there about the need to get a visa and, and to get drivers recognising an essential skill. Are there any other barriers to that, uh, Seamus? And secondly, I suppose you mentioned as well the shortage occupation list. I suppose I'd be keen to hear what the British Home Office's response has been to to the asks of the of the sector in relation to this. I mean, have they been responsive to the needs of business, or do you find that they're sticking to that hard Brexit ideology? Because I mean, I certainly think the proposals that you've made there and the suggestions make sense, um, and I think it's something that we should be um, moving towards. Yes, um, yeah, I'll answer that. I suppose um, initially, Logistics UK, we asked uh, the, the Home Office for 10,000 permits for no uh, less than a year for drivers to come here. Obviously, it was in the news that 5,000 were issued for a three month period. Um, I think the uptake has been extremely poor. I think we had less than 200 applications to date so far. Um, I certainly spoke, I spoke to a member of ours based in Derry uh, yesterday. Uh, they had um, three drivers who are originally from Poland but live in Donegal um, apply for work, but that company is unable to employ those drivers because they don't have settled status in the UK. And obviously their skill doesn't mean that they can um, seek employment as drivers here as well. So it's very frustrating, especially I think in your own constituency and along the border counties for the ability to employ EU nationals living on the other side of the border. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you, Seamus. And I mean, that's something maybe we could could be looking at as well. Just the only other question is in relation to the the significant regulation with some of the enforcement agencies. Um, just to get a, a wee bit more of a detail around that and, and how you're finding that and what are the key issues. I know even locally we're, we're having issues where things, you know, the checks and deliveries are being, um, as I say, maybe over-regulated. Um, so it's just to kind of get a, a bit of a sense of that as well. Thanks, Chair. 
I think maybe Liz, if I can come in on that. Certainly feedback from our members is that there is a, a, an overzealous approach by some of the enforcement staff, not all. I appreciate it's a fine balance because we are talking about road safety and fair competition at the end of the day. But some of the some of the infringements that the enforcement agencies in Northern Ireland are pursuing drivers and companies for, uh, let's say, to me, who's an ex-enforcement person, I think they're being overzealous and they need to take a more pragmatic approach. The minister had given us some assurances that uh, there would be a light touch, particularly given the issues with COVID and with Brexit. I certainly haven't seen that light touch, uh, uh, I say, from quite a number of members. So I would ask that uh, you know the enforcement agencies take a more pragmatic approach. But bear in mind, just yes, road safety and fair competition. But it doesn't mean to say that they should be prosecuting for every offence that they detect. Okay. Thank, thank you. That's an important an important point that we can maybe take up. Okay, I go to Roy Beggs now. Uh, John Martin from the Road Haulage Association indicated that uh, lorries, I think it was him, lorries were coming back with only 50 to 75 percent payloads. What's the cause of that, and what happened previously? If I can come in there, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a number of factors. Um, one of the factors is obviously the new trading arrangements and the restrictions on the movement of products. Uh, it, Operators, and I say Chris can maybe come in with the detail, but operators have found that the flexibility that they have in relation to picking up product and the bureaucracy associated with bringing vehicles across and that vehicle identities have to be declared. Uh, you have to get export health certificates if you're bringing mixed loads of foodstuffs across. So all that's adding to the, the loss of capacity and the loss of efficiency within the section. And it, it, it means that vehicles have to come across with less product because it's too much hassle and downtime trying to fill the fill the vehicles. Maybe Chris, if you could come in with some more detail. Yeah, sure. Um, we presented this to Lord Frost only four days ago, then uh, brought it down here, and he he concurred that this was a situation that's happened. Is that there's confidence has fallen in the GB marketplace to supply in Northern Ireland in an economic state, which means in fact the supermarkets are no longer supplying Northern Ireland with the total product lines that they were before. They've reduced the lines on the shelves. They have repositioned themselves from buying from the south of Ireland instead of buying it through Britain themselves, supermarkets such as M&S, Sainsbury's and Tesco's. So a lot of our return journeys would have been retail product coming back in to Northern Ireland to replenish the shelves. Hermes and Next have also reduced in deliveries into Northern Ireland because the cost of movements, because there's no bureaucracy involved, where if you're moving a part load or a full load, it has the same cost, but if the part load becomes a pallet, it comes too dear, economically not satisfactory to supply Northern Ireland. So we're seeing that the GB marketplace are not supplying to the same level, food and other household goods, even the you know, products that we would take to be standard are no longer available in Northern Ireland because of the cost of movement and the volume of purchase that we purchase in, if that makes sense. Okay, but thanks for that. In terms of um, drivers, there's obviously a short-term crisis, but there's a longer-term problem uh, emerging as well. When you've you've indicated that the average age is 56, so I, I see that there is apprenticeship schemes operating in, in England and Wales. Uh, when do you think a scheme will be? How, how does it operate, and when do you think such a scheme could operate here? If I come in there, uh, Mr. Beggs, sorry, um, I know that there is work going on with the uh, App CNI, um, with the apprenticeship program for Northern Ireland, the Department for Economy is looking at this across various sectors, logistics, hospitality, construction and health. Um, no decision has been taken yet. Um, there is the potential for a fully funded all age apprenticeship, which would suit our industry because we do have that limitation of young people entering the market. So to make an all-age apprenticeship, whether someone is 21 or 51 or 41, would be welcomed to our industry um, because people will look for the experience and the age with regards to insurance. So that is something that we need really the assembly um, to apply pressure on. Um, I was told initially that such an apprenticeship, apprentice scheme could be up and running before the end of this year, but it hasn't been signed off yet um, by the department or the minister. So we need action on that urgently. 
Uh, Chairman, I think we should be writing accordingly to the uh, well, economy committee. We can, we can come back on that point. Thank you, because I am rushed for time. Okay, can I ask Cahill, please, briefly, then followed by Andrew and then Patrick, and hopefully we can we can fit all members in. Okay, Chair. <coughs> Thanks very much, and I welcome the um, the presentation to the committee today. Just, just three quick points. In terms of the number of drivers, um, how many drivers have we lost the industry in relation to both Brags and, and obviously COVID? The other issue is the EU workers um, who have gone home and haven't returned. Is that impacted by the very fact of, of the way the, the government um, points based immigration regime in the Tory government? And also in relation to the Brexit related chaos that's going on in England in terms of the filling stations and the queues. Are we like to see that happening here? Those are my three key points. And Chris, thanks very much for, for reminding me. My father was a lorry driver and managed the time was housed in the cab when I was a kid too. But there weren't only lorry drivers no days, there were mechanics as well. They used to look after lorries, so a fond memory of that. But just those three questions, and I'd be like to answer them. Thank you. Um, Cahill, if I answer on the points based with the immigration, um, in the logistics sector, 68% of the jobs in our industry are level two, they're classed as low to medium skilled. So we've been hit really hard with the new home office rules and the ability to hire EU nationals, hence the, 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 a factor with the driver shortage with us um, on, on that. So hopefully that gives you an idea for the uh, impact that's had you. Just if I can maybe come in, Chairman, there just to highlight that it's not a UK wide issue. This is a European and a and a worldwide issue. We have a number of members from from Ireland who are also indicating, despite them having access to EU drivers, that they have a shortage. So it's 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 not a a UK problem, and and the fix will come from within the UK. It's a worldwide problem that needs to be looked at and addressed locally. And in terms of the number of drivers lost the industry? I would have, Cal, our figures are national. So we've, we've lost 16,000 EU drivers uh, in the past, uh, up until March this year. So it's probably more when you add on what's happened the last few months in them. So I don't have a regional figure, unfortunately, for here. Okay. Okay, Cal, I'm going to have to move on to another member. In England, um, the queuing up at the filling station, do you foresee any of that? Uh, common here. I've spoken. Um, our members would be the fuel distributors and the retailers. So there's there's no such issues here. We've got two large fuel depots, both in Belfast and Lissa Halley, uh, and there's there's no problems here. Um, the re retailers haven't experienced uh, the same problems that there has been specifically in the in the south of England. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm now going to move to to Andrew Muir, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for everyone for coming along here this morning. Um, I think it's no doubt that Brexit has a, has a significant impact upon the issues that have been out, outlined. The figures have already been quoted in terms of the number of people who have left the UK and haven't came back. Um, we're also uh, within the UK. Free movement of labour is a significant issue. I know that the UK government has offered the temporary visas up until Christmas, and the uptake of that has been very small, unsurprisingly. My question really would be, what is the plans um, after Christmas uh, in terms of the, that, that easement? Also, the other one is in relation to insurance. I know that there's a real issue there in terms of young people and uh, the um, companies being able to get the insurance at an acceptable price and what engagement there has been with insurance uh, companies in relation to that. Uh, and the last one's really just around examiner recruitment, whether there's any more action you feel needs to be taken. I think after we've had the, the evidence session with yourselves, I think the committee really does need to be writing to the department in relation to the suggestions around designated examiners, also in relation to the, the Minister for Economy, in relation to all age apprenticeships, and also in relation to the regional shortage occupation list. There are practical actions I feel that this committee needs to take in response to the evidence given. But my question is really is, uh, what do the, the industry understand is the long term future beyond what's been given in relation to the temporary visas, and also any issues in relation to insurance for young people? 
Hi, Andrew. Um, I, I'll come in very briefly first because I want to make sure the other guys get in. Uh, on insurance, obviously that's a private commercial matter. Um, we need the insurance industry to listen to us. We probably need a bit of pressure from government on that because it is a barrier for young drivers. I do know some of our members have recruited. I know in your constituency as well, Andrew, um, one of our members took on two young drivers recently at a huge cost insurance-wise, but they figured the investment was worth it, uh, but it's still a barrier. Um, after Christmas on the visas, there's no certainty given to us by government at all. We, we really need visas and we need more of them for a long period because quite simply, uh, an EU driver isn't going to leave uh, a reliable job in the Netherlands to come for short-term work in the UK. Nobody would do that really in their right mind. Um, so we need something a bit more solid on that. And um, with examiners, yes, um, I think the department, the DVA, need all the support they can get from DFI for the recruitment, the training of HGV driving examiners. And I think Justine's point about delegated driving examiners, that's critical. If you can give the likes of Henderson and Manfred and some of, their, some of the good professional operators who will maintain the exact same high professional standards as the DVA, it takes the pressure off the DVA and the cost and the workload to do that. If I could maybe just briefly come in there, Chairman, just to add to what um, Seamus has said in relation to DVA. DVA had um, staff that were multi-skilled previously that they could do HGV tests, they could do uh, ordinary car tests and they could do vehicle inspections. They seem to have moved away from that and lost the flexibility. If they had a pool of staff that could do the full range of duties, maybe they'd be pay paid slightly higher, but it would give them more flexibility to deal with peaks and troughs. Okay, Chris. Thank you. Andrew, from a point of view from our business, uh, we worked with insurers over the last 10 years and principally with two key providers, RSA and Amit. We have worked on the Driver Academy scheme, as I know Henderson's have as well. The ratio of damages, accidents from the drivers with their own academy versus those that we uh, I'm going to say took in from other businesses was dramatically less. So the insurers are in favour of the academy solution because it gives the driver the skill set he needs other than just a licence. At the moment, when they come into industry, they have just a licence. When they go through the academy, they get the practicality skill set they need to complete the tasks. So it has a positive impact upon insurance if we do the right way. Okay, and Justin, yeah, and I, I would just agree with those points as well. And we've introduced a driver mentor scheme as well. So drivers within our business um, are supported on their entire journey uh, within the organisation. And that has the knock on effect to reduce uh, damages and, and, and hopefully premiums then as well. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to have to now move on to another member. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, just very briefly, uh, thank all the members for their contribution and just to reiterate what Jonathan has already mentioned that it's really, really good that you're in the mode of finding solutions and hopefully that's what we're here to help do. So on that basis, I was wondering what support you've had from the Department of Infrastructure and from the Department of the Economy to help find solutions because that has been a common theme from all the speakers here today. Hi, Patrick. Um, quickly for me, yes, the, the, the DVA have been listening to us and the department, um, especially with the recruitment. One thing I've been speaking to them for quite a long time is, is to get some of the, the normal like um, car driving examiners to be upskilled to um, do LGVs. So that is happening. There is £18,000 being spent on that. Uh, and then obviously the recruitment then of more examiners to fill the void to do the normal car testing for those guys to do that. So that there's good. Um, there is the process, the DFI with the new test centres being built across Northern Ireland. What we, what we should be doing now before we are building those new test centres is can those test centres accommodate um, LGV tests? Because that's good because we are limited to three test centres. If we can spread it out to more geographic areas, that's a good thing. It gives more flexibility to the likes of Chris and Justine as well. Uh, and the last thing, basically, with your department, DFI, um, is parking and access. So drivers, you know, it is a stressful job. So let's have secure parking when we're building roads, whether it's the A6 up the dairy. Let's have secure laybys, parking, toilet wash facilities for drivers. They need that. 
you wouldn't expect employees to put up with that in an office. So let's not expect our drivers to keep supply chains moving to put up with that. And also with urban access, drivers going into places like the centre of Belfast, um, th- those drivers uh, shouldn't be faced with having to double park or can't continually drive around a city centre trying to park. There should be sufficient HGV loading bays for lorries. There isn't in Belfast. We need to commandeer some of the car parking bays to LGV parking during, during the daytime. And it makes it easier and faster for those drivers to make deliveries. Yeah, that was something that Justine and John had both, um, you'd both mentioned about trying to get more female drivers um, into the industry. And I was wondering, is there anything else that could be done to ensure that more female drivers do become part of the industry? I thought maybe if I can come in there, Chairperson, a lot of the facilities, particularly in GB, where a lot of our local hauliers would uh, travel to, the facilities are extremely poor, to say the least. And uh, everybody needs top-class facilities that they can facil- you, you know, use for either rest or for washing or for having their breakfast. That in itself is a significant issue for uh, females and males entering the sector, and it's something that the government needs to take up. Uh, not only locally, but but nationally. But what I would say is, locally, I think the executive needs to develop a task force staffed by the Department for the Economy and the Department for Infrastructure and supported by industry to look at this because we need to join up and look at the solutions both in the short, medium and long term. Okay. Um, you know, and, and finally, and I thank you all for coming, and this is a sort of a... You know, it's a, it's a it's a broad topic that crosses across many different departments. But can I ask? Obviously, in in the short term, there's been much conversation around temporary visas and how uh, that can help fill some of the shortages that that there is at present. Uh, alarming to hear the the low uptake in that. But there has been the accusation pushed towards not only the haulage industry but other industries that they sadly have become uh, addicted to cheap foreign labour. Now. The accusation would say that that has prevented the industry from uh, from looking forward in relation to what has been mentioned today about, for, for example, higher wages, which has been a result uh, of such, uh, you know, putting schemes in place such as training academies, uh, mentor schemes, bringing young women into the industry and attracting younger people, all things in which uh, you all have, have brought forward to the committee today, which are useful and certainly things that need to be taken up and supported by government going forward. But how would you respond to that accusation that essentially um, uh, an addiction to cheap foreign labour uh, ha- has meant that the industry hasn't been able to properly prepare uh, for a shortage which is, now, which is now global? I'm not saying I'm directing that criticism, by the way. I'm asking how the industry responds to the comment. Chair, uh, I'll go quickly first. Um, there's analysis that Logistics UK has done with uh, Adzuna and with Manpower. Um, wages from one year ago for lorry drivers across the UK are up 20%. Um, the UK national average is now £33,500. It's very good money you can earn as a lorry driver now, but we're still not having a lot of UK nationals apply for those jobs. So it's not an addiction on EU nationals to come here and do the work. It's simply because we can't find enough people here to want to do that. Because when you look at inflation on salaries, yes, there's inflation on driving jobs, but also there's inflation right across the entire economy on salaries. So people have more choice now. I think Anne Chris uh, alluded to it earlier. So that's the obstacle we have. So it's not that for the want. We do want people here to apply for those jobs, but it's getting the uptake and the incentives. Okay. Anybody else want to briefly come in on that before we, we round this up? There was a university course in Georgetown, which I attended myself back in the early 90s, which has been uh, taken away in the last six years. And we this year has been a foundation degree put in to regional colleges. So we, as an industry, were recon- not recognised by local government that they actually took the accreditation for not just, I'm going to say drivers, but for planners, operators, and people who manage our business. If they wanted to go in the career path here, they had to go to GB marketplace, GB universities to get the accreditation. Once there, they stayed there. So Northern Ireland lost a skill set and an era of individuals coming forward to help us manage our businesses and recruit. Thank you, Yannick. I think if I can maybe just come in briefly to say that the logistics sector is a highly regulated, um, highly stressful and low margin industry. Uh, I think government needs to 
to look at the industry and see what it does for the economy and see it as critical to the economy. The National Health Service is critical to people's health. Um, the logistics industry is critical to the lifeblood of the economy uh, in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. And any last comments before we leave? That's no different. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I thank uh, every one of you for, for coming? Uh, uh, Mr. Seamus Lahey, uh, Ms. Justine McGreevy, Mr. John Martin, uh, Mr. Chris Lowley, and uh, Mr. Stephen Hazley. Uh, thank you all very much for your presentation. Um, certainly, it's a lot for the committee to take away, and indeed, uh, look forward to how we can interact both with the Committee for Economy and the Department, uh, and indeed the Minister for Infrastructure, to try and uh, put conditions in place which help your industry at this time. So, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Uh, all coming back in. Okay, members, thanks very much. Uh, I know probably, uh, George, I'm not sure if you wanted to ask a question there, but I couldn't see your, your hand raised on screen, so apologies if I didn't get to you. We were tight for time because we had taken more time on the departmental budget briefing than, ex sure. than expected. I suppose there's a lot of takeaway points from that, and I'll let members, and we'll, uh, I'm sure everybody wants to speak in this, but we, we are cut for time. Uh, but I think it does merit further discussion, and I don't want to just cram it in here at the end of this session. Uh, I want to have a, a proper and thought out uh, sort of line of, 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 of attack going forward on this. There been a number of points that have been raised by the industry there. I think this is potentially something that we can discuss in our strategic planning day, uh, because I think there's, there is room and merit for, for a joint committee meeting with the Committee for uh, Economy uh, to see uh, if we can tie up and look towards that task force which was talked about uh, by the industry there in relation to tackling some of the immediate problems. I think um, another point that was raised, I think Liz brought that up, was the uh, enforcement and the overzealous enforcement which a lot of the industry are facing at the moment. I think that's something that we can take up with the department as well. I'm certainly hearing of a lot of that in terms of how it's become more unattractive for people to get involved. I see Dolores says she's having difficulty, so I will bring Dolores in first uh, on the issue. But what I'm trying to say, members, um, Instead of we've got a brief time now, I'd prefer maybe if we could uh, try to be focused on on action points and look towards a strategic planning day about how we could maybe tackle this issue uh, in the wider scheme uh, going forward in the time that we have left in this mandate. So I'll go to Dolores first. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd lost signal there for quite a while. <clears throat> I mean, I'm happy for the, the forward work. Do I think it might be useful in advance of the forward uh, uh, the planning? To, is to find out uh, what actions, if any, you know, are being taken within um, the Department of the Economy, particularly around regional colleges, to see whether or not there's any uh, outreach uh, to the college sector by the colleges. And uh, I don't know what, how we could ascertain what sort of interest, you know, from careers advice or from, I don't know whether it's in, still in D, DFC, you know, the, um, when people come into the job market, um, you know what advice they would get from uh, coaches, etc. Uh, you know because it it is something that requires collaborative work. And sorry, one further point because I do have family members who work uh, in the sector, and one of the observations was that some of the older drivers who I think they were trying to get to return find it very difficult to operate uh, with the new IT systems, etc. I just wonder about refreshing people's skills or making life a wee bit easier for. Uh, for some people who get very anxious uh, around some of the new technologies that are now uh, a part of the business. Okay, well, that, that is issues that we can take up. I think if there was a sort of a, a joint sort of committee approach, it would be very interesting because it would take in that aspect in terms of the training and capacity, but also in terms of our remit as a committee for infrastructure, looking at the regulations involved uh, for driving the, the bureaucracy involved and indeed also testing. I think those are all aspects that, that we could bring in. Uh, I'm going to go to Roy Beggs. Uh, Roy? Just, just follow up on what Dolores has said there. Um, we should be looking at, at what the, the barriers are. I know there has been suggestions for looking at a return to HGV driving scheme, um, which might allow uh, some to get back into the scheme. And, and, I, and I see that uh, the CPC uh, requirements there, the 
and um, continuing professional um, competency requirements uh, and, 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 and learning might be barriers. I think we should uh, learn more about what is required, uh, and particularly if somebody has been working in an industry their lifetime. We are in a, in a urgent situation at the minute, which we look at, are there some temporary measures that could be taken to ease? And there's been suggestions even exempting that for a one-year period. We, we, I think there, there's practical issues, uh, stress on drivers uh, and industry, uh, and I think a uh, responsible government needs to see how we can respond in a reasonable way uh, to that. Uh, I think uh, regarding... Um, overall training and, and what our colleges are doing. I think that's an excellent idea uh, and it's been indicated that the, the, the issue of uh, those who uh, help to coordinate drivers and be aware of all the, the new bureaucracy, there is uh, academic uh, skills required there as well. Um, who is responsible for ensuring that that, that occurs? It's probably the Department of the Economy rather than ourselves, but perhaps we should be writing to flag this issue up to them uh, that, that, that they ensure that uh, the haulage industry uh, and the warehouse industry, we were told there's shortages in the warehouse yeah. industries as well, that, that those skills are there and that those career options are made, of, uh, young people made aware of those as career options where, where vacancies exist. Okay. Um, Andrew Muir? Yeah, Mickey Chair, just a suggestion around the old age apprenticeships, and I'll be writing to the Minister for the Economy to seek support for that. And as I said, you have said as well, we can consider this as part of our strategic day next Wednesday. Okay, and uh, AOB. Oh, AOB. Okay. Members, um, what we will do is we will task the clerk to, to, to take away some of the points that have been raised by members. Uh, I know there's quite extensive. Uh, points raised within the presentation. Sorry, George, do you have a question on that before we move on? Yeah, yes, I do, Chair. Um, my my worry is um, in relation to the examiners. They, they had mentioned that um, there's only two locations, one one Belfast and one Portadown. I think they said. I think they should they should need, need to be looking to one for the northwest as well. But I think that it is, there is very, very important. New, new buildings, Portadown and Belfast, George, are the three that they mentioned. Right, I didn't catch that. No, I thought it was just the two. Yeah, I think they were afraid of you being from the northwest that you'd kick that one up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so look, mem members, know, so we're, we're going to try to pull together a sort of a, a program of uh, action points that came from that briefing mm -hmm. um, in terms of whether it's correspondence to the committee for for commit our economy, correspondence to the minister of the economy, correspondence with the minister for infrastructure and indeed committee action points that we can take forward to try to support the industry in what is a difficult time. So thanks members for your indulgence in that. Uh, I think it was a very useful se uh, session. Okay, moving on members to agenda item um, number 11. Let's bear with me. Okay, which is any other, or sorry, agenda item number 10, which is the forward work programme. Can I draw members' attention to the proposed draft work programme for the next meeting at page 262, uh, draft uh, forward work pattern. Are our members content to have a strategic planning meeting next week after the formal committee session? And I would ask, uh, what I will do is I will uh, ask the clerks to put out a formal email to every member asking for their availability for that strategic planning day. And I would ask members to please indicate at the earliest opportunity because we need to have a full turnout in order to make it a productive session. Members agree to that action point? Me. Okay, thank agree. you. Uh, and uh, I see, oh, sorry, yes, uh, so members are agreement to, t to attend and attend in person, please, where possible, because uh, uh, there will be a sandwich provided and it will certainly be uh, a productive meeting, uh, working lunch. Uh, and does the room facilitate us all attending? It's the Senate. I'm sure it is. We're, we're in the Senate chamber, so, okay, so yeah. it should attend. Okay, agenda item number 11, which is any other business. I have one item which was raised by Patrick. I'm sorry, I see Liz raising. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, so it's from Into the West in Derry. I've picked up on the issue. There are 21 new train carriages um, across the north. And what they're looking for is to make sure that a lot, quite a number of those carriages are brought onto the Derry to Belfast route. It is a route with extreme overcrowding at the minute. So what I'm proposing for the committee to do is to write a letter to both the department and the Translink to propose this. Okay, I, 
I think we need to ensure that they are used where there is the most extreme yeah. pressure, and yeah. we need to learn where that is. So I, I think, well, at the minute there is a lot of overcrowding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think what we need to do first of all before the committee would take a position like that is let's explore uh, what the use is and where the pressures are in the system, and following that, uh, we we can then take an appropriate action. Well, could a letter be written to you request? Where the use is most needed. I, I think I think no. absolutely that there's no problem with that. I think mm -hmm. I would be comfortable with to try and find out where where the use are is where where the intent intended mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. for the the new train carriages are, are going and where the pressures are at present. Mm -hmm. I think that's more appropriate as opposed to a committee. Yeah, position. there's been extreme overcrowding, particularly around Balsanic and people returning to university then as well the last number of weeks. So it has obviously become a really pertinent as you know. Okay. Well, we we can. Uh, our members content with that action point that we, we try to establish where the need is and where the intended train carriages are to be. Agreed. Members are content with Agreed. that. Agreed. Agreed, Chair. Okay, Liz Kimmins on the final AOB. Thanks, Chair. Just two quick ones. Um, the first one just was raised with me around the cost of provisional driving licences. Apparently, and it wasn't something I was familiar with, but um, the, the provisional licence uh, fee is the highest in England, Scotland, Wales and in the South. So it was just to raise that maybe with the, the department to see is there something um, we could look at in terms of that, particularly as a lot of younger people um, who are certainly a part of the provision. OK, well, what, what we can do, if members are agreed, that we can inquire what is the pricing structure at present uh, and have a comparative model uh, across the United Kingdom to see where we stand on that before we take a decision. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Chair. My second point is just, it's actually on behalf of a colleague here in Yuri Arma. The, um, I know they've made contact with the private office uh, in relation to Carrick Crop and Hill housing development in, on the quarter road in Camla and they still haven't got a response as to do with issues to do, to do with incomplete work and I think there's their safety concerns so it's just to bring that to attention um, and ask if, if we could get a response your points, as well. Your point's on the record and I know members didn't notify me of any other business uh, but I'll take uh, so Cahill's the last one briefly please because we can't... Sure, sure, you know, this is briefly but I would support you in this here because it's happened a number of cases. The issue of getting budget, those papers you know late um, we didn't have a chance to, you know, uh, whilst there's only eight pages, I mean, we don't get a, a proper opportunity to, to, to scrutinise. We tried our best to bring out some questions. So I would support you in any actions to bring it forward to ensure that we get the papers in good time in the future. OK, well, Thank we, you. we can write to the department in that regard. I, I've put it on record that it was unacceptable and let's hope that it, it doesn't return. And hopefully the, the officials being able to brief us in person will also help with that communication issue. So thank you, members. I'll now move on to agenda item number 12, which is date, time and location of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 13th of October, 2021, in the Senate Chamber, Parliament Buildings. Can I advise members in the room of the need to maintain social distancing while leaving the room and to ensure that they remove all their own papers, water bottles, glasses, etc. from the meeting room when they leave. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, members. Well. Assembly, Committee Room 29.